prerequisites kind of minimal because this is a diverse uh, audience. It's really <laughs> nice to meet new people. I, a lot of people I've never met before, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, speak here. Thanks to the organizers. Um, yeah, so, so anytime I say we, that means uh, this guy and me. Okay, so we got him in the Okay, <laughs> well, I, I may say we. I, I once gave a talk, um, actually, at Lumini, where I just said we the entire time and I forgot to mention. So, <laughs> yeah, I forget to mention the Jefferson <laughs> Um Okay, so uh, here's the uh, setup. Um, uh, I'm assuming I have a bounded domain, so I'm going to have discrete spectrum, no, no scattering here. Um, it's going to be open and connected, and I'll assume the boundary is Lipschitz or better. I mean, basically, hot spots conjecture is not known for any domains. Well, I mean, it's known for some dumb, some things, but if real analytic, if you just assume real elasticity of your domain, that's if you can prove something in that case, great. I mean, so it's not a question about how good the domain, how good the boundary is. And I'm only interested in the second Neumann eigenplot. So in particular, I, uh, and so you, I'll try to keep you just representing second Neumann eigenfunctions. So I think of these as uh, minimizers of the Dirk of the Rayleigh really quotient over H1. And uh, the hotspots conjecture is since, well, okay, there, there are different, very, there's different uh, ways to state the hotspots conjecture, um, the way that uh, people have um, settled on most recently um, are one of the variants that people are interested in. It's simply that um, if omega is, say, uh, convex, Uh, then this implies that um, uh, U achieves its uh, global extrema only on the boundary. And so I, this, you know, these Neumann eigenfunctions have extensions, continuous extensions. So sometimes I want to think about the U as living on, I, when I saw it, I'm thinking about U as on this open set, but then we're going to take the closure. And, uh, in that sense, we'll think of the ext continuous extension to, to be where you can achieve the uh, an extremum, either a max global maximum or a global minimum. Um, but in fact, I mean, what what we think is true, or I think I think everyone thinks is true, at least at this point, is the following. So, um, omega is say contractible, meaning it's homotopic to a point, implies that uh, U has no critical points. in the interior being omega in the open set. No critical points at all. So um, so there's there's some there's evidence for this in the form of work, which I tried to I haven't given every paper, but I've tried to give the ones that at least were influential to me. Um, uh, here and, and there's also numerics. I mean when so this conjecture was uh, is due to Rauch um, in about 1974, or it was published in 1974. There was a conference and he introduced uh, this problem. So, they, um, and uh, there, at that time, you didn't have computers that probably were as good as the ones that we have now. <laughs> I think this was about the time when you still might have stacks of cards that you fed to. I don't know if some, some people are here old enough to remember that stacks of cards to do a computer program. Yeah. <laughs> Did you make a mistake? 
on one card. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have column flips. But, <laughs> but yeah. What is contractible? Contractible means I can homotopic to a, a point. I can find a, a deformation retract, for example, because, or the homotopy groups. So, so a spherical shell is simply connected, but it's not contractible because it has a sphere inside it that you can't. Uh, sometimes people say simply connected. It's the same in 2D, which is really what we want to discuss. I, all, all these results are essentially 2D. Yeah, I think all these results are 2D. There are some uh, results. Uh, there was some early work, I should maybe mention by Kowal. One of the earliest things was in, in higher D, but um, but basically everything's in 2D. In that case, intractable means simply connected. Okay. No holes. But in higher D, I think, was probably true was contractible. Okay, so back to computers. Computers at that time probably couldn't um, uh, say much, but numerically now, this is such a low energy state, right? This is the second eigenvalue. So computers can very quickly find that eigenfunction. And you can draw up all kinds of crazy domains, whether they be convex or not. And you always see this phenomenon, no interior critical points. So, you, yeah, I mean, and there are people who have actually done sort of rigorous numerics as well, but you can just get your favorite, you know, uh, program out like PDE toolbox or whatever, and you can just um, compute to your heart's delight and see that you'll never. <laughs> of course, you know, finding critical critical points are are very hard to find in a sense because um, they were the gradient is zero. So when you're actually looking in a place which looks like the gradient might be zero, etc. But there are ways to get around that. For example, you can. Uh, Sometimes use indis, you can use the uh, Euler Poincare, or the Poincare Hopf theorem to, to prove that whether you have critical points or not. Anyway, those, that's the numerical thing. So, numerically, this is really seems completely true. Uh, right. And another thing to notice is that if you like Roban problems, if you might ask, what about a Roban problem? So, if if I add on, say, this is over omega, omega. Suppose I add in alpha, uh, boundary of omega, e squared. And alpha is positive, then it's false immediately when alpha goes positive, right? So, so, so it's in sen that sense, it's sensitive to perturbation. If you if you will try and change into quadratic form, no, nope, not true. You won't be alive. Okay. And okay, so let me, um, I've grouped these results not by sort of the methods being used or, or, or the context. Um, and so it was May 74, and then um, about 25 years later, there was actually some significant progress that occurred. Um, and so the original conjecture was, didn't have this uh, contractibility or simply simple connectedness and so Birdsey and Bernard found a multiply connected domain for which it was false. The conjecture was false. And, and Birdsey later found an example of a, just a, an annular domain or topological annulus, for which it was false. And so then it was decided that uh, so simply connected this should go in. Um, and then ben, so that was a negative result. Then the positive result, Ben Lewis and Birdsey uh, they proved it for things like obtuse triangles and also sort of domains that were sort of in one direction. All of these results, uh, well, maybe based on the names, you know, are, are coming from probability. They're coming from using, there's an interpretation of this problem in terms of Brownian motion, okay? Because we're looking at uh, the second Boyman well, eigenvalue basically tells you what happens in long time for the heat heat equation. So the first in the, you know, at, at long time, all things end up going to the constant function, but the next at the really interesting part, that's the second eigenfunction. And, um, and so uh, the heat equation is certainly uh, involved here. That's why it's called hotspots. Um, and then 
uh, Pascu is a student of Manuelos who proved that if you have a, um, a, a symmetry where the eigenfunction is um, uh, just a single re reflection symmetry and the eigenfunction is an anisymmetric with respect to that symmetry, um, then it's true. And in fact, that's related to what you can do more generally for mixed problems because um, you have um, a domain where uh, say you assume, for example, Dirichlet here and Neumann there, you can also ask whether there are hotspots for, well, it won't be the second eigenfunction, it'll be the first. First eigenfunction, if in fact you extend this across as a reflection, then sometimes that, re that reflection will be the second eigenfunction. And so it's interesting to look at this problem where you just have half. And recently there was a lot of results in that. This is just a student. Um, and, and Lawford will talk at a uh, few minutes to tell you more about his results and uh, about this problem. Okay, so that was Pascu, and then Atar Birdsey uh, proved um, that it was that hotspots held for what are called lip one domains. So let me say what a lip one domain is. Um, so you take a Lipschitz, you take two Lipschitz functions, and you take their graphs in the plane. So like I said, everything we're doing is an R2. So I'm taking a function from R to R, F plus F minus R. And I'm assuming that uh, the graph of say F minus um, is below the graph of F plus. So this is the graph of F minus. And then if I put the graph of F plus, it's, this is going to be F plus on top. I generally was piecewise linear just because I like polygons. You don't have to be piecewise linear. So this will be the graph of F plus on the top. And they have common sort of endpoints, these curves. That's called a lip domain, provided the Lipschitz constant of F plus F minus is less than or equal to one. So they can't be too like this. They sort of have to be squunched up. Squunch is a technical term. <laughs> Does that make sense what this definition is? So those are called lip domains. They include, for example, uh, parallelograms, for example. This is a nice. And it also includes parallelograms like this because I could take my coordinate axes to be that. We can, all, we can always. Or How important is it to prove that it's one lip one? Very, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, it's a good question. So, it, it, well, I mean, so the worst is sort of if you have sort of an angle like that, right? And pi over two turns out to be a crucial angle for these problems. Um, in particular, the Bessel expansion, well, you can do a Fourier Bessel expansion around in this coordinate, and uh, things tend to go wrong at pi over two. This is the. It's less than or equal to one is a kind of strange condition because, as you said, if you can have a rhombus like that, and this, it is definitely in one coordinate system, it is definitely greater than the. Right, but, but then you kind of try to turn it and make it less. Okay, so it's a uh, very good point. So, so actually, we ended up uh, proving um, that the uh, later, much later, proving that these domains also didn't satisfy hotspots conjecture. But we had a different, we had a more uh, intrinsic characterization. We didn't use graphs of functions based on coordinate. We did a coordinate-free right, definition. And then we had to figure out that, in fact, um, what we had proven it for was actually these. <laughs> so, so there are different. There are there is a there are coordinate free ways to say this. It's just it's kind of a nice way to do it. Um, also, I maybe I say um, 
Jonathan Rowe letter has a new method for proving um, this. So Latar and Birdsey prove that hotspots is true for these. This is these have two hotspots. In fact, the hotspots occur here and here. So you might think of this as the max, and this is the min. And basically, the idea what you want to show is that as you and this, the original idea of uh, Latar and Birdsey, what, and also it, it originates here in Benuelos and Birdsey, is that basically you take any vector field, a uh, constant vector field. So the one constant vector field might be this one, or a constant vector field might be that one. And if you apply it to the function u, then um, it's positive. So it's it's monotone in sort of this general direction. It's monotone in this sector. If I take if I take directional derivatives in that direction, so that's um, that is sort of the idea here, and it's also an idea that's used in this paper for a letter, and um, and also, but I also row letter had a different description of these domains that wasn't lip one, and then he had he had to find out that in fact. His domains were exactly the same as his hard Birdsley. So in that sense, these are very natural domains because three different gr groups came to these domains as being the ones that don't have hotspots. And then they realized that all of them were the same result. What makes these two points special? Because this angle has this, these are acute verses, if you like. If this is a polygon. Why are they acute? Because I'm requiring that this be, well, it depends where you put the axis. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's the whole one. problem, right? Because you can have straight angle, uh, right angles, for example. Yeah, so if you like, I mean, sort of the way that we uh, came across this was, was simply we wanted, we had an acute vertex and we have another acute vertex. And then we want, we just basically fill in with obtuse vertices. That's 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 how this comes about. But it, you're right. It, it does depend on. Um, but I'm saying what I should say is there exists, if you like, any choice of coordinates for which this the domain looks like this. With acute vertices there in there. Well, once once you choose the right set of coordinates, these will be acute. They can be ninety degrees at these. These yeah. angles can be ninety degrees to endpoints. They can, they can, they can be exactly 90. That's it. But that's to me, that's a limit. Yeah. Can be exactly. I, I should say that there is a, there is a bad case. Uh, I, okay. So the, the square is actually a bad case, um, but that's the only bad case. What does bad case mean? Uh, good means hotspots is true. Bad means not hotspots is true. So, so uh, this means, so hotspots is, um, well, hotspots is true, but what I should say is um, the monotonicity is not necessarily. So hotspots holds for the square? Uh, hotspots, I can't, uh, yeah, hotspots, uh, does it hold for a square? You can, that's an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a square is that exercise. Okay, <laughs> um, but but is it is it clear the definition, the exact definition? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. <clears throat> Could you say um, the reformulation of what it What does it say about the Brownian motion? Uh, I'm not. I um. Um. Yeah, I'm not. I yeah. Yeah. I'm not, well, first of all. I mean, I don't think I remember. And second of all, it's um, it's actually complicated to, yeah. Um, uh, right. So okay. Right. And then there was uh, yeah. Oh, there's also been some work by Miyamoto, Sugeya, um, and Terence Tao, some of which appeared on Polymath. There was a Polymath project for this. And um, what you can find is Polymath 7. Um, it was opened in like 2012 and it ended in 2013. Um, 
so there's uh, these are very nice um, results, auxiliary results about second Neumann eigenfunctions. And then there was um, some more probabilistic but creative work done by Steinberger in around 21. In particular, um, he looks at the maximum on the boundary. He doesn't assume hot spots is true. He looks at the maximum of the second Neumann function of the boundary. Um, he looks at the maximum of the interior, and he shows that the maximum of the interior can't be that much far off from the maximum of the boundary. He has a like what he calls a hot spots constant, which is sort of the ratio of the maximum on the interior divided by the ratio uh, by the maximum, the value of the maximum of the in, in, uh, boundary. You'd like that to be one um, or better, but uh, he originally showed that constants uh, less than 60. And now it's been um, pushed down by others. But I don't know how far it is right now. Yeah, that would be fun to know, actually. If it is pushed by half, it doesn't seem... No, it's it's pushed to really small numbers now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, I can't remember. Um, I don't remember the, the, uh, the numbers. Apologies, yeah but you can find references to his paper. Okay, that's another direction. And then um, uh, Jonathan Rolleather, as I said, was able to reprove by using, instead of the quadratic form uh, here, he uh, took a related quadratic form on vector fields. So if you know, it's kind of like taking, if you have on a, on a two-dimensional surface, if you, Instead of thinking about um, the Laplace spectrum for functions, you can think about, about the Laplace, Laplace spectrum for one forms. And you can translate the Neumann condition into a different condition. And you can look at the quadratic form there. And um, although he doesn't say it in terms of one forms, uh, you can just say in terms of vector fields. If you okay, and so, and that gives another proof of this Lipschitz I wasn't going to say Lipschitz. Actually, I, didn't, I wasn't going to uh, lip one. The lip lip one domains. Oh my! my ha, Laura Clawford asked me to say a few words about it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, these are the mixed problems. Okay. So, any other questions about sort of this very fast review of what's happened? Yes. I say more about continuity method. Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, it has my name in it, but I better say something about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, I've, so basically for the rest of my allotted time, I want to discuss uh, about this method, yeah. um, which is what I know best. Um, right. Um, so, so, um, so I, maybe I'll just give you tell you what these results are about. So Jerison and Narashvili uh, proved the result, a positive result that hot spots are true for biaxially symmetric domains. That's something that has a reflection symmetry along the y-axis, a domain that has a reflection symmetry along the x-axis. And of course you can read the system. <laughs> um, uh, so that's Jerison and Narashvili. And then uh, it was open for a long time as to whether um, acute triangles were, that, that was actually the, the subject of this polymath project. For acute triangles, do you have the uh, hot spots conjecture? For obtuse ones, remember, it was proven by Ben Wallace and Birdsey. And it actually falls within um, this regime as well, the obtuse triangles. Well, acute triangles were sort of a a a, um, a block there for another twenty five years, or it's almost 20, well, twenty years. Um, and then recently, so so this was a headache. This was a uh, uh, we we, uh, we found this part, and then Cheng Gui Yao recently um, published something with, or well, posted something, which I think gives a better proof. I mean, it's just the cleaner, nicer proof 
Um, so I want to uh, go through this and, and show you how this works. Everyone remember what Hot Spots Conjecture is. <laughs> and, and I'm going to be focusing on this one because that's what these results prove, the, the strong one. So U has no, no critical points in the interior. Right? And that's what, um, what most of these results prove, in particular oh, these three results. OK. So, uh, method of continuity. So, <laughs> a crash course of method of continuity. I mean, in some ways, I expect everyone to know what method of continuity is, but I'm going to formalize it. Uh, um, the method of continuity. So, um, so we're going to let B be a set of objects. Whatever your favorite objects are, whether they be operators, spaces, groups, or whatever they are. So you want to topologize uh, B uh, so that B is connected. And you want to check whether some property holds for all elements of B. So you look at all those elements of B, so uh, B satisfies property P of this. And then um, the method of continuity asks you to say, prove that A is not empty, open, and closed, and if you know that, then you know that A must equal B by connectivity. Right? Well, that's what the method of continuity is. Right? It applies to very general things. So if you're a graduate student and you want to prove something, sometimes this is a nice thing to do. OK. So uh, for us, um, the property we want to show is this. So B is going to be set up, say, convex domains, bounded convex domains. Um, we're going to take the Hausdorff topology, right, that's already been mentioned in this conference a couple of times, right, on, on these. Um, and A is going to be the set of omega uh, such that uh, there are no critical points in omega. Okay, so um, so. Um, B is is connected. You can continuously move from one uh, convex domain to another by deformation. Okay. Um, it's uh, the questions are: Is a um, non-empty and of course by um, Previous results that true true for example for the lip lip one domains we know their lip one domains are the obtuse triangles um, this is true or you know, squares rectangles all kinds of nice things okay so um, right and then uh, a is open. A 
me is what do I want to say? Let's get confused. Well, it's not what it calls me to. So um, if I have a sequence of domains that's converging, the, the eigenfunctions converge. So continuity of eigenfunctions tells me, you know, and also their 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 critical points will converge. If I had so if I can so the critical points will remain on the boundary if they were in the boundary for the sequence. Excuse me, just one quick silly question. The U here is a minimizer in omega in in this definition of A. Uh -huh. Well, it's a minimizer of Rayleigh quotient, yeah. Yes, yes, in omega. In omega. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, yes. just integrating over omega. Yeah. Okay. You can have multiplicity. You. Exactly. You can have multiplicity. Yeah. So there, there are actually two. There's. Uh, I'm allowing for multiplicity, so it could be any minimizer. It doesn't have to be the minimizer. But but there are questions. I mean, you can phrase hot spots. It's not known. In this, in the weaker formulation, where you say just. I just want one eigenfunction for which I know hot spots is true. I mean, it, it all you know, all, all these different statements are not known. But for the strong version, it would say I know that for every uh, eigenfunction in that eigenspace, that hot spots is true. That would be the strong. Okay. So um, and it's closed this by continuity of uh, eigenfunctions and their critical points. So the question is: Is a Oh, and something has to be hard, and so it's the it's the um, oddness which is problematic. That continuity isn't so difficult because this house door topology is quite a, not a terribly strong notion of worry. For, for Neumann problems, then. Um, I, yeah, just I'm just uh, um, no, but I mean I'm just saying. In other words, I'd like to say that the the complement is uh, closed, so I can look at sequences coming from another direction, and they can converge as long as they're converging Hausdorff. It should be. It should be. And the con these are convex domains too, so it's better. I mean, if it's in general, for non-convex, this may be uh, more problematic, but I think in the convex case, yeah, this is not a... Okay, so, um, right. Okay, so, um, so I, what I want to say is what can go wrong, why couldn't it be open? And let's just look at what could happen to go wrong. And so what could go wrong is you have, um, you have your domain omega, and one thing that I could go wrong is the critical point moves to the boundary. So, so in this case, what I'm saying is, in other words, going the other way, maybe I should, because I stated it in the other direction, I have a critical point and it moves interior, moves into the interior. So I started with the critical point. So at my starting point, I'm in the set of things which satisfy hotspots, and then suddenly something moves into the into the interior. Okay, so that's something. But then even worse than that is um, a uh, hotspot can just suddenly appear. <clears throat> uh, so these are the things I have to beat. So what I'm getting at is that one should study sort of uh, how critical points change under perturbation. And um, there are a couple different ways they can do this. I mean, the the they can't do it in a very haphazard way because at least in the interior, these are real analytic functions. And in fact, if I assume that the 
boundary is real analytic, which sometimes is nice to assume, then they have real analytic extensions. And therefore you can even assume that the, um, that the uh, everything's real analytic up to and beyond the boundary. And so these functions can't do cr too many crazy things with their critical points. Um, for example, if we have, so let's suppose we have like a, we're assuming a Neumann condition. And suppose I started with a critical point here that gets moved off. If this is a, um, say the real axis, and I reflect, I can reflect the eigenfunction, there's sort of a Schwartz reflection principle for, well, across straight arcs. Um, then I, and I get something which is odd, uh, even with respect to this reflection, a U, I can extend U to this lower half plane. It's an even function. So if I have a critical point that moves off, I have another critical point that moves off. Right? If I reverse in time, it means I have two critical points that move back. And so what happened, the picture is that, suppose these are both like, uh, Maxima. So this is the this is a contour plot. So here's my. Um, and this is sort of a uh, this is one possible situation. But the idea is that um, as these points move together in the limit, it's going to form a degenerate critical point. Okay. If you like the point three hop index. Um, is more than you should expect. So, so for example, the, the, so U will, in some sense, look like X squared plus Y to the fourth. When you bring two critical points together, it's still a singular critical point. I mean, it becomes a critical point. So that means that Just before we get to this, um, at this, at, if we start with something that sort of moves off, then it must have been a, a degenerate critical point to begin with. Um, if a critical point uh, appears spontaneously, how can a critical point appear spontaneously? Well, here's sort of the picture. Um, the contour plot might look like this. That's a, there's no critical point there. But I might introduce something like that, which is a cusp. So in particular, in this partic in this type of situation, y is equal to um, going to be equal to, uh, sorry, uh, u, u, at least morally, so for so many terms, will look like uh, y squared plus, uh, and then there'll be some constants perhaps, and then it'll be like y to an odd greater, y to an odd power greater than equal to three, like y cubed, it's a cusp. That's what U looks like. Okay, I'm 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 omitting the actual Taylor coefficients. There are Taylor coefficients there. There could be a Taylor coefficient here and a Taylor coefficient there. But but this is the first part. What I'm writing here is the first part of the Taylor sketch. Maybe it's X. No, so it's not. Is that wrong? Oh, X. This is X. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you have a cusp. Okay, and cusp are the only things that sort of spontaneously appear. And you, so, you, so at the moment, so at the boundary of the set of uh, uh, this set, where um, what you'll see is um, either cusps in the interior, or you might see um, <laughs> the cusp will so you know the cusp may be there. Uh, at your point on the boundary, but then it suddenly disappears by doing this. It disappear. 
and that would be that. So we don't want cusps to, to be there. So at the boundary, we either have uh, cusps in the interior or we have degenerate critical points in the boundary. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so, um, yeah. Can cusps actually appear in the uh, little sets of the uh, eigenfunction of the Laplacian? Thank you very much. I mean, that's that <laughs> it seems incredibly weird to me. Oh, but yeah, it did to me too. So, uh, um, yeah, I posted on Math Overflow. You can find the question, and and um, Will Melkies gave the the uh, the actual told me told us how to do it, which was well for high eigenfunctions. You just look at the square, and you're in such a large eigenspace. Look at the square, and you have incredible multiplicities. Such a large eigenspace. You just just by dimension count, you can sort of push the eigen choose a linear combination that has a cusp. I had some REU students do this, and 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 they have a little paper. So so yes, cusps can appear for high eigenfunctions, and then we didn't uh, we weren't sure about the second one though, and then we showed that that uh, in a paper that Sugata and I that uh, for sort of perturbed triangles you can get cusps, and we can't tell you exactly where they are. It's sort of um, but we know that they're there. So so we know that um, for a something that's, you take an acute triangle and you make a sort of a slight uh, bend. So they even exist for the second, for quadrilaterals. Uh, Chen Gui Yao proved that they don't exist for triangles, which is something we thought was going to be true, we thought, but we failed to prove it. And Chen Gui Yao actually proved there are no cusps for triangles. But for quadrilaterals, yes. Okay. Any other? Okay, yeah, there's. Okay, so this is um, slide three of uh, eight slide talk. Um, <laughs> it's always the case, right? Um, so, how many minutes do I have then? Um, yeah, so I, I want to say, yeah, so I'm going to say something else, kind of elementary thing that goes into this. Um, okay, to rule out these sorts of um, uh, things, these degenerate critical points, I have to use something about the eigenfunctions themselves, something about the equation. I mean, we're, t we're talking about a differential equation here, so I have to use something about the PD. Where does the PD come in? And um, so let me describe where it comes in. So, um, well, there's, there's of course, uh, Clear claim monotonicity. Well, it's not so clear why it comes in, but it does. Um, and but uh, there's a fact by well, in general, it's Bears and Chang. It says that um, if you have any solution. This is just for a generic eigenfunction, not you anymore. This is so for anything psi. Um, the nodal set is a topological graph. And it, I mean, it's has some smooth properties, except that, that the vertices, there's some things to check. But um, so it looks like, you know, it's a graph. It has in every every vertex is a critical point. Not the only critical points, these are just the nodal critical points. Um, and then there is a fact by that in the convex case is due to Puglia and then um, Friedlander. And um, 
proved it in non-convex, and Filanoff gave a very elementary uh, two-line proof or something like that. So mu2 and omega. The second Neumann eigenvalue is less than um, the first uh, Dirichlet. I mean, there's other, you can go to higher eigenvalues with this, but I'm only interested in mu2, okay? And uh, what this together, these two things together, um, give you a nice, Corollary, which is used by Jarrison, Nashvili, and us, and everybody who's doing the continuity method uses this, is a proposition is, suppose you know that you have something, not necessarily the eigenfunction itself, but something that satisfies Laplacian psi is equal to mu2 from psi, then this implies that psi inverse of zero is a topological tree. meaning it has no loops, okay? So it has to look like okay? And, and the reason follows from just this. I mean, suppose you have your domain, omega, and uh, you draw your nodal set, psi inverse of zero, I'm not assuming any boundary conditions on psi, and suppose it had a loop somehow, I don't know. The loop looks like this. And so th this is a loop. And suppose that, uh, well, because this is a nodal set, um, this is omega prime, this little connected component, and it satisfies Dirichlet conditions. Well, by domain monotonicity, that eigenvalue, omega prime, is bigger than the eigenvalue of lambda omega which is bigger than uh, by the Friedlander or, yeah, is bigger than this, but that's a contradiction right? because um, mu2 has to be, that's, the, uh, yeah. that's a contradiction, uh, right? Yeah. What did I do? It's yeah. equal to mu2 as well. I mean, it's right, right. These are equal. Yeah, exactly. That's a contradiction. These are equal by assumption, right? Lambda one, because well, it could be less than actually. I should say, I should say mu two lambda one actually may be. It's not going to be, but it's in fact it's not. But okay, yeah. Right, mu two is my lambda one. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, that's uh, that's a very nice fact. Uh, okay. So, um, what else can I see? For example, um, yeah, good morning. I can say, for example, if if psi is equal to to u itself, um, then I know that um, there are only two components by Courant, and therefore the the nodal set actually has to be a simple arc. This tree becomes just a, just a single arc, because if it had if this tree were uh, larger, it would have more components. But I know by Courant, it only has at most two components, right? Courant's nodal domain theorem. Okay. And so, what can I say? Wait a minute. Okay, then, um, so, uh, actually, using this, you can get sort of a maximum principle. I mean, in some sense, we have the wrong sign for our. Um, uh, we're, we're on the eigenvalue side, so you can have some uh, fluctuation, but the fluctuation is not so much. But in fact, you can actually uh, prove a maximum principle. So, using this idea. So suppose Laplacian psi is equal to uh, mu2 psi. In fact, mu2, this mu2 only has to be less than uh, lambda one. Um, and I'm not assuming any boundary conditions. 
And then, um, and you know that psi is bigger than or equal to zero on the boundary of omega. And this implies that psi is bigger than zero in omega. Does everyone know that? I just curious. How many people know this fact? Oh, good. Okay. Lawford knows it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very huge fact. And and uh, uh it follows from from just uh, from this. So um the suppose to the contrary, the proof is suppose the contrary, there is a point where um so is actually equal to zero. Well, it has to, it's a topological graph and I should have said it actually is a topological graph that extends to the boundary. It can't end somewhere. So it doesn't have a single, it has to have an arc in it. Or this could be actually a vertex, but it, this, this thing has to continue. So, and it goes to the boundary and you get your so-called modal domains, which are the confluent to treat. Um, it, does, it's not satisfying boundary conditions, but you can still analyze its its boundary, uh, its nodal set, and um, also the because it's an eigenfunction, you know if it's like plus here, positive here, eigenfunction psi has to be negative there, and minus and plus, plus like that, and so you can take a uh, negative component and. Uh, let's look at a negative component and restrict our eigenfunction there. Well, we know along the boundary, it has to be bigger than or equal to zero, but it's negative here. Okay. And it's continuous up to, to the boundary. So it has to be zero along here. And then we already know it has to be zero there, zero there. And then we just apply the Friedlander result, just as before, but in the same way. Okay. So... Um, this is actually it's in all, this this um, this is actually written up in a paper a very sticky uh, Nuremberg <laughs> and uh, uh, the Vardon from a long time ago but and they do it in much more generality than what I'm doing it they do it with semi-linear things and yeah okay. so. Uh, um, so maybe I'll just say a few words about how this is used. This is uh, implicitly used in the jerison ashvili argument, uh, this maximum principle. So there, they wanted to look at biaxially symmetric domains. That were convex. So like an ellipse, I, I have a hard time drawing any biaxially symmetric domain, which is an ellipse or a rectangle or something. So you have this coordinate, and then you have this coordinate. And remember, I'm, uh, the domain the domain is invariant to this reflection and that reflection. So it's just about jerison. And um, what they do is they, um, apply this fact to the following. Suppose I take, um, well, first of all, they, they, they use the continuity method. So what the, the assumption is, is that the function parcel x um, of u in the x direction, this is the x direction, is uh, greater than or equal to zero on the boundary. So it's monotone. And in particular, this is going to be the minimum, and this is the maximum. So this is the uh, condition which defines the set B um, that I use in the continuity method. So we take biaxially symmetric domains, that's our set, we topologize connected, and then we ask for this property to hold. And if this property holds, then we're good to go. Because then if this is uh, so why is it we why are we good to go? We're good to go because of the maximum principle. So if I take the partial of x, uh, Laplacian of the partial of x times u, partial of x commutes with the Laplacian. So I get partial of x Laplacian u 
which is equal to, well, u is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue mu2. So I get mu2 partial of x u. So I apply this maximum principle with psi and psi. So if I know if I know that on the boundary my uh, derivative first derivative is uh, greater than or equal to zero, then I know that um, the x derivative in the interior has to be positive. I can't have a critical point in that case. No critical point. So this maximum print. So then I just have to concentrate on this. So they have to worry about this. Okay. But so. Yeah. The first eigenfunction disappears when you differentiate it, right? It's no longer an eigenfunction, really. It's a solution to a PD. It has no boundary conditions. When I differentiate, it has no longer any boundary conditions. But what is the significance of mu2, then, in, in the maximum principle? Is that, is that I, it's a PDE where this is the second. I, this is the second Neumann eigenvalue. So this came from boundary conditions, but psi does not. Good question, yeah. Um, okay, so let me just quickly wrap up by saying, <laughs> um, you know, in this case of triangles, no one thought there should be monotonicity. No one said this kind of monotonicity, which is actually also in the lip one domains. I think the triangles were unsettled because no one was gonna try to do something like this, where you assume everything is monotone, right? And so, and when we looked at it, problem with triangles, we didn't use anything about maximum principle, any monotonous, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we worked too hard because then Ching, Gui, and Yao, what they do is they brought this back in. And so their, their main contribution is if you have a triangle like this, where this is the shortest side, they show that in this direction, you get monotonicity. So their condition is now pi, this is bigger than or equal to zero on the boundary. And they work with that. And it turns out to be much better. We, so we were working with the maximum principle behind our back. Right? We didn't use that. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.